And I'm going to take just a really quick side journey. Because if this week I hope to have it back out on, the, on our website. But back in 2019, for those of you that were here, we had a young minister come in. His name was Reverend Tim Brown. Tim gave us a message that the Lord had just been kind of stirring around on the inside of me and prompted me to go back in and listen to. So I went back in and listened to it over the weekend. And basically, just in a nutshell, he said, the Lord had told him when he came two years ago, he said, go encourage them, for they are tired. They've been standing. Go encourage them that what they're doing is important and significant. In God's eyes, what we're doing here is important and significant. And then he brought a message uh, out of, I believe it was Hebrews, and not to forsake the assembling of the gathering, and why it was important for us to come together as a body. Because when we get tired, our arms become feeble. Here in this house, there are people that <clears throat> will uplift, up, undergird, uphold us. <clears throat> in our times of trouble. And so it's important for us to understand because he told us again within that message that we have to speak the vision. We have to live the vision. And one of the things that, you know, that God's grace is sufficient, it comes in the time of admonition, <coughs> use me, that's that <laughs> health bar. I shouldn't eat all those healthy bars before service. Peanuts. And so the admonition was that whether by revelation, by vision, that when things come against us, that his grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. And so... When we feel like quitting, when we feel like it's, we're not going to make it, when we feel like it's <clears throat> almost too hard, we are to encourage ourselves in God. We are to encourage ourselves in His Word. For we are triumphant, even when it looks like we are not. And so His Grace Church has a purpose. You have a purpose, and we're going to be looking at that in this next series. God has a divine destiny and a purpose for your life. You are not happenstancely been placed here on the earth. You are not just happenstancely been placed here at His Grace Church. You are part of the divine calling and the divine purpose that God has for this house and for your life. Without you, oh yes, we could go on, but it sure is much better with you. When you're in your place and you run your race, it will be in his grace. When you are not in your place trying to run your, run your race, it'll be hell on earth. Sometimes it may seem as though it's all come together, but most of the time it will be, it will be a mess. And so, one of the things that we want to impart to you by revelation. You know, there's instruction through the word of God. There's vision. You know, the difference between direction and vision. Vision is where we're going. Direction is how we're going to get there. So we need direction. We need vision. And then we also need the revelation from heaven. Because the revelations can sustain us in the times of trouble. Now, I'm not talking about, ooh, ooh, I'm talking about things God speaks to your heart. And so when we look at revelations, one of the revelations that came this year is what God said to Pastor Kim, and I agreed with it, what God said to Pastor Kim uh, when we were in a, I want to say in a ministerial gathering or retreat, you know, God speaks to us in preparation for what we are to speak to you. And... You know, I'm going to narrow it down to just a, a statement, but basically she, he said to her that 
This is not a venue such as when musicians gather and, you know, and we have all this great music. It becomes a venue for an outsource of music. This is not a venue. This is a destination for his visitation. And there's a difference. And so that's the revelation for what we're coming into this year is that we are a destination for his visit for a visitation. Destination, visitation. And I want to encourage you this morning to strengthen your heart knowing that everything we're walking through is because of a purpose. We are putting the word of God in and out into a lost and dying world and we have an enemy. But thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph that we will not be defeated. Hallelujah. His Grace Church in 2014, the Lord Jesus himself spoke to me this. He said his Grace Church must rise from the ashes. And at that time, his Grace Church wasn't even, we were just a ministry. We had gone from a church, the board of directors, we moved it to a ministry. And then in 2017, his Grace Church became the reality again that God had called it to be in 2000, or 19 and 98 when Pastor Kim and I began the church, which formulated or accumulated the vision that began back in the early 90s. And you know, the devil has been there all along to prohibit and inhibit the work of God through this organization. And I will declare to you this morning that thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph here at His Grace Church. And so in 2008, we closed the doors to the church. But in 2017, God said, let it rise. Hallelujah. And so we're going to be looking this morning at dream killers. So let's just start with a word of prayer before I get too excited. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that the entrance of your word gives and brings life and light. We thank you this morning, Father, that your word is alive, it's active, it's sharper than any two or sword, it's piercing the dividing asunder, as it says, and it just goes out and it doesn't come back void. So this morning, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, who's our comforter, who's our guide into all the truth, and that you'll help us to facilitate the word of God in a manner that all hearers can not only hear, but understand. And so... Again, I want to welcome you to His Grace Church, man. We're so excited to have you here on campus. And those of you that are watching through any one of our online multimedia sources, welcome. So let's get right into the Word of God this morning. I've titled this morning's message, Hold Steady. Hold Steady. Well, that's an interesting title, Pastor, yes, because over the next uh, 10 weeks, we're going to be learning about how to hold fast, to hold on to what God has given us. And just to give you an idea of some of the things we're going to be looking at, you know, this morning we're going to be looking at how to hold steady or hold fast to your word, not my word, your word from God. Then next week we're going to look at four crazy friends. Four crazy friends that will come to steal, to kill, and to destroy your dreams. Four crazy friends. And then from there, we'll look at how to come into divine alignment with the plan of God. How not to give up on our faith. We're going to be looking at how, what, what is the real behavior of faith. How do we sustain that fire that we get in our heart when we first get that plan and the purpose from God? We'll be looking at how Faith and patience is a marriage that produces results. And then we're going to start looking at how to take steps, how to fulfill our dreams. And in this particular part of the series, we'll look at the consequences of surrender. But this morning, we're going to be looking at how every one of us has been selected by God to fulfill a specific purpose on the earth. Say this with me. I have been, I have been selected, by God selected by God to fill, to fill a, specific a specific purpose, purpose on, the earth. on the earth. I know I hate declarations too, but it's still good. 
Right? Okay, I, when, when the, Pastor, I got to really say that? Yes, because if you'll say it, you'll believe it. And if you'll say it often enough, it'll get into your heart where it'll become a reality. So many people don't believe that God could select them to do a specific thing. Maybe general things, but specifically. You know, the dreams that he plants in each of our hearts is unique. Uniquely and fashionably tailored to who we are, what we are, and to see that the dream becomes a reality that we must learn to fight against the draining, what I call dream killers, that press against our souls. Just because God gives you a dream doesn't mean it's going to become a reality. And, I'll, and I, I say that because God can place things in your heart, but if there's no action upon those things, they'll die. So what's a killer? We've titled this Dream Killers. I thought about dream assassins, you know, dream robbers. But what's a, what's a killer? Just a simple definition of a killer. In my book, I would think that a killer could be a hired assassin. A hired assassin, which is a person who has been assigned or has an assignment to take you out, to destroy you, to kill you, to remove you, right? Now, other words we could use to define a killer well, might be a, a slayer, dragon slayer, right? A slayer. I, how about a liquidator? <laughs> That's a good one, right? A liquidator. What's a liquidator? Well, he's kind of like an executioner, or there could be a hit man or a hit woman in today's society. Hallelujah. And so in this context, we would not be then wrong to define a dream killer as someone or something that has come to kill, to slay, to liquidate, and execute your dreams. That's a pretty powerful statement. But, Pastor, can you define a dream? I most certainly can this morning. What's a dream? A dream in the context of what we're going to be talking about would be a cherished aspiration, an ambition, a purpose, or an ideal. So a dream is a cherished aspiration, am amberbation. <laughs> Never mind, it's a purpose or an ideal. <laughs> Aspiration, ambition, purpose or ideal. So this morning, has God spoken to your heart and given you a dream, an ambition, maybe a desire or a goal or something that he wants you to do for him? And if so, does it seem like it's an impossible task for you to accomplish? You know, God doesn't give small dreams, small visions. God gives the impossible and expects us to believe it into existence. Hallelujah. I'll say that again. God gives the impossible and expects us to believe it into existence. Woo! That's even a better title than what I got. Hold steady. God gives us the impossible and expects us to believe it into existence. But have you been hindered by obstacles and that seem to come out of nowhere that will harass and maybe even halt your progress from time to time? Here's the good news. <laughs> You're not alone. And we're not talking about home alone either. You are not alone. You know, Back in the mid, mm, the early 90s, some of you think, well, when, when's that, Pastor? That's back before you were born. <laughs> Hallelujah. Back in the early 90s, Pastor Kim and I were, were given a dream. We were given a dream. And that dream was to pioneer and pastor a church in San Antonio. Just in case you're not sure where San Antonio's at, it's Texas. We were given a dream. 
Had no idea how it would even come to fruition. But God spoke it in my heart. God began to confirm it in Pastor Kim's heart. And the process of coming to grips with this new direction for our, for our lives, I don't know if, but we had many unanswered questions, many unanswered questions along with many challenges that blocked our way. Whew. If I could tell you the early years, <laughs> sometimes I do, <laughs> you know, I'm surprised we even made it. But God, who always causes us to triumph, he will always give us the impossible to believe to bring to fruition through our faith. So when we look at all these challenges and all these difficulties, we can call them dream killers. They've come to kill. They come to steal. They've come to destroy. And in this lesson and those that are going to follow, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to share some biblical truths that will help you push past all the doubts and fears that are keeping you from fulfilling God's calling. Listen, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be challenges along the way. That doesn't mean that you're not going to have opportunity to miss it, to fail, to mess up. Just know that those opportunities and challenges are going to appear and it's going to happen. But what you do with those challenges and opportunities will determine your progress forward momentum and completion of the task. But it's very important. First and foremost thing I want you to understand this morning is that I want you to know that God handpicked you before the foundation of the world. Think about that. God handpicked you before the foundation of the world. And this statement I'm going to make, if you don't think it's true, just look at me. There is no one else like you anywhere on the earth. Might be people that might look like you, may have some attributes like you, but you are one of a kind. Took me many years to realize that I was one of a kind. I thought I was a mistake. I thought I was flawed. I thought, well, I know I'm imperfect. Thank God for that. Makes Pastor Kim's life doubly fun. But there's nobody like me on the earth. And it's taken me years to realize that I can be me. And if you don't like me, tough. Find somebody that you do like. But you don't have to like me for me to be me. So there's no one else like me or like you anywhere on the earth. And I know some of you are probably saying, thank God for that. Right? One of Pastor Mike's enough. But when you were created, now that was a great place to say amen. You missed it. I agree, Heavenly Father, one of Pastor Mike is enough. When, <laughs> when you were created, <laughs> I, you're just getting it now. Okay. Uh, I'm going too fast. That's okay. <laughs> when you were created, God gave you fingerprints, an eye pattern, a voice, and a chemistry that is uniquely yours. Uniquely yours. And in the same way, he's also gifted you with specific talents and skills to accomplish an assignment only you can fulfill. Oh, yeah, he can raise other people up, but it's not first choice. I remember the story of, um, oh, I see her face float in a always white dress. Catherine Kuhlman. Thank you. I was over here with the ministry staff. I'll come over here to the real folks. Catherine Kuhlman said this. I'll never forget. I was in one of her meetings. I heard her say this. She was asked the question, 
She asked the, the father one time, why me? Why did you pick me? He said, I didn't pick you. You weren't my first choice. He said, five other people turned the job down. You answered it. So sometimes God may use other or look to other people. But when we answer the call, he equips us so we won't fall. So I'm still a firm believer that he's also gifted us with specific talents and skills to accomplish an assignment that only we can accomplish. Now, you know, Pastor Mark, has, he has a master's degree. Pastor Kim has a master's degree. But yet, that doesn't mean that they're, that they're, they're uniquely the same. In fact, they're so far apart. Pastor Kim operates in a business. Pastor Mark is more in theology. Both of them are excellent at what they do. But just because they have a master's degree and been educated, let's say they were educated at the same school, they're still not going to come out with the same education. Right. So now, again, God has gifted us with specific talents and skills. Is it up to him to just open up the book of knowledge and say, here's everything I've given you? Or do we have to find those sometimes? Sometimes we have to find, we have to search them out. The Bible says in, in the message translation of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. So each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it and everyone benefits from it. So what makes this truth even more profound is that God had his hands on your life even before you were born. Now wrap your head around that one. I didn't know me before I was born. Did you? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, reading from the New Living Translation. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Well, even before he made the world, God loved us. How could he love something he never knew? God loved us and then chose us in Christ. The word chose in this verse is a Greek word, and it's a compound of, of a word ek, which means out, and the word legomai, which means I say. When these words are compounded, the new word, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, ekalegomai, means to call, see, I thought that was pretty good. Thank you for that positive reinforcement of your Greek. Not bad from the Greek scholar, not bad. Not French, but it's all right. So means, it just means to call out, to choose, to select, or elect, or select. So it means to call out, to choose, to elect, or select. It was used to refer to individuals who were selected for a specific purpose. In fact, it was the very word used to describe men who were chosen to serve in the military. They were elected. They were selected. Moreover, this word conveys the idea of the privilege and honor of being chosen. Of the privilege and honor of being chosen is also connected to the idea of privilege. That those being selected should look upon themselves as honored, esteemed, and respected. So... Rather than badger yourself and say you're not worth anything, say what God says. You know, I've heard this so often in the body of Christ. I'm not worthy. Oh, I'm not worth anything. I mean, Pastor Kim and I at one time, I mean, things got so bad here at the church that, you know, we walk, we'd walk past each other in the house and just put up the L on our forehead. You know what that means? We'd look at each other. We're losers. And one day, God said to me, 
I did not create you a loser and quit calling yourself what you are not. I'll put it in his language. Quit calling yourself what you ate. I ain't a loser. See, he talks to me and, you know, he talks to me a pretty good redneck. I ain't a loser. I'm a success because he lives in me. And so, but we are so con conditioned to speak what, what we believe to be the truth, which is actually a lie. So instead of badgering yourself and saying things I'm not worthy, I'm a loser, I'm not worth anything, then we have to begin to say what God says about us. What did he say? He says, I have been personally chosen by God. I have been personally chosen by God. He brought me into this world, and I, because he brought me into this world, I am, and I say it like this, I'm such a privileged individual. See, you need to esteem yourself. You need to esteem who you are because God has already esteemed you. He did it when he said, even before he made the worlds in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. The word before in this verse is a Greek word, pro, P-R-O, which means long in advance of. Long in advance of. And another translation reads, in the New King James, it reads it like this, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, according to this verse, God already knew you. Right? He already, know, he already knew you. And it goes on to, to, to verify that he had already selected you long in advance before the foundation of the world was ever put into place. Think about that. My grandfather would say, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Think about that. So when we look at this particular passage of scripture, it moves us again into the next word. This brings us to the word foundation, which is katabolie. I'm looking at my Greek scholar. Katabolie. Sounds French, doesn't it? Sounds glamorous. Where are you going? I'm going to the katabolie. <laughs> so when, when we look at this word, it's a compound of the pre- Preposition of kata meaning down and the word balo, which means I throw or I hurl. When kato and balo are put together, they form the word kata bole or kata balo. It, what it does really, it just pictures um, an act that occurred long before or in advance of when the first layers of the universe were hurled into place by God's spoken word. See, think about this. That's how long God has been waiting for you to be birthed on the earth to fulfill your destiny. You're not an accident. You're not a hap stance. Hallelujah. You're not even an afterthought. <laughs> but it's, it's normal to have questions, isn't it? I mean... You know, I think I can say this with some, some certainty that many of us have a, maybe a good idea of God's calling on our lives. And because of that, we've started out passionately pursuing our purpose. But, here's the but. <laughs> but, because the fulfillment of our dream or dreams have dragged on Year after year, month after month, day after day, however long, the fire in our heart has dwindled from a raging furnace to a mere flicker. And tragically, we haven't learned how to navigate the hindering, dream-destroying destroying forces that attack our mind, our will, and our emotions. Consequently, what begins to happen then, instead of moving forward, pressing out, running 
the race. We begin to retreat from what God has revealed to us. And when we do that, we just begin to simply watch life pass us by. We're not. How many of you ever heard this? I have no purpose. God gives us purpose. And nothing is more tragic than this. That a person would let go of his or her dream. That dream, that very purpose for which they were born into the world to do. God is very specific. He's not a, eh, we'll just throw it out there and see what happens. So, I have found this to be true many times that when I begin to lift my foot or begin to step out, to step forward and begin to obey the Lord, every part of my soul will scream and say this one thing, two things, three things. Now, see if this, this, little, this little thought is played in your head. What if I'm making a mistake? What if I'm making a mistake? Here's another one I hear quite regularly. What if this doesn't work? <laughs> I'm going to look like a fool. I just got up and said this. What are people going to say then? What are they going to say? Because I will have gotten myself into a mess. Now what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Anybody have those thoughts? Some of you. <laughs> Hallelujah. And although many people try to ignore or even deny the existence of these kinds of questions, I just believe they're a normal part of the process of a person who is thinking about doing something new in their lives. Count the cost. So instead of hiding from or maybe ignoring the questions, begin maybe to search out and pray for the answers. Wouldn't that be a novel idea? Because they're good questions. What if I fail? Find out what God has to say to you. What if it doesn't work? I've come to the conclusion that if it doesn't work, it's not on me anymore. If it's truly, now, I've stepped out on my own and st done stuff, stupid stuff that thought it was God and wasn't God, and it failed. That's on me. But there ain't been, hard, I, don't, I don't recall a time I've stood out, stepped out when God said step out and had what God said fail. I've had difficulties, harassments. I've had my own minds, my own thoughts. But, but for the most part, if we, if we don't quit, if we don't give up, if we don't stop, neither will God. That's why God speaks to us in impossibilities in, a, in our heart that we can birth through our faith. You got to see to believe. But in order to believe, you've got to speak. Some of the things God puts in our hearts are, are, are so ginormous that you think, oh, you crazy, God. You ever had those moments? You crazy. I don't know how to do that. He says, I do, and I'll show you. Some of you may require re-educating. Some of you may require education. Some of you may require reformulating thought processes. Some of you may require relocation. It don't matter. God's got a plan. If we'll follow the plan, he says, the footsteps of the righteous man are ordered of the Lord. So... Instead of hiding from and ignoring these questions, begin to search out and pray for the answers and prayerfully seek God's wisdom as you look at every question, as you face every fear, and as you examine every doubt. And don't puff yourself up with happy answers. Be totally honest with yourself 
and God. And then don't stop seeking him until you've heard from him. For he has equipped you with the answers you need to decide what you're going to do. So often we ask, but, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little secret about myself. Is that okay? If I want something in my house, I'll pester Pastor Kim until I get it. I will. Sometimes I have to ask more than once to make my message known. Sometimes I have to ask continually until I get an answer. Sometimes I'll get a barking order. Sometimes I'll get a kind, loving answer. But no matter what, I'm going to get a response. And if I don't get a response, I don't stop until I do. You ever heard about the dog in the bone or the dog in the lake? Lake, leg. He don't let go until he gets what he wants, right? I think sometimes when we talk to God... We don't have that tenacity to stick with it long enough until we get an answer. Oh, God, you heard me. He said, knock and the door will be opened. And keep on knocking. Keep on knocking until you hear. Right? So then why would we just ask one time and then if we don't hear, we just say, oh, well, God does it. God's too busy for us. No, God's not too busy for you. But sometimes you need to have the tenacity to continue to seek the wisdom and advice that is necessary to bring to pass what you're looking for. And the other thing I, I know about God is he speaks at some of the most inopportune times. I'll give you an example. Most of the time, I might be on, now, I, up until it got really hot, you know, here in the summer, I walked five days a week. 45 minutes. That was the time that I spent with God. And that was the time God would, would commune to me and talk to me and say things to me. And I, I was quick to write them down because I don't know about you being hot and sweaty outdoors. The last thing I want to do is remember what God said. And so when God speaks to us, be quick to write it down because he may not, he may not speak to you in complete uh, paragraphs, but he may speak just enough to, to, to strike a note of your faith. To encourage you. Yeah, you're going the right way. But if I don't write those things down immediately, by the time I get home, <laughs> I'm blonde, there will be a lapse of, well, I don't want to say memory, but there'll just be, it'll go, into, it'll go into storage and may take some time to pull it back up. So I'm learning to write things down when God speaks to me. Because if you follow a pattern, if you write things down over a process of time, you're going to see a pattern of what God's saying to you. And it's going to confirm and not deny the plan, the will, and the purpose of God. Many things that we do here at the church have come through a process. I was reading my prayer journal and I, I, it goes back to 2012. Now, it doesn't go every day. I don't write. I'm not. Listen, one thing I am not, a journaler. The psychiatrist, he would like me to jot down my emotions and write these things down. And I'm like, oh, heck no. They need to stay locked up and put away. So I don't write. Now, when I do write, I'm a prolific writer. I don't know when. To, it's like... I don't know when to shut up. Yeah, 20 pages. I, this is how I feel. This would be a good book. So, but what I found through that journal is that God has been speaking a specific message for a period of time over five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. You say, Pastor, you awful slow. No. I just want to make sure I got it. So when we go to God in prayer and when we ask him, then we need to expect him to answer. When we get that answer, then the next thing that I think we really need to do is we need to count the cost. We need to count the cost. What does it mean, count the cost? Well, there's nothing wrong with taking a real good look at the new endeavor that's 
been placed before you. And, you know, I, I firmly believe, you know, that Jesus highly recommends that you count the cost before tackling whatever the new task is. Right now, Pastor Kim and I are working on a, on a, a, a business plan and moving the church forward. And we're, we're, we're looking at things and we're counting the cost. Luke chapter 14, verses 28 through 30 says, but I'll read it from the New Living Translations. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin a construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? How many of us would just try to build a house knowing that we have no idea what it's going to cost, but we're just going to build it anyways? No, we need to know what it's going to cost us so that we can be prepared to facilitate it to the completion of it. Verse 29, otherwise you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's that person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Now, I've, I've probably heard that in other areas. Because the reason many people fail is not for lack of vision. Now hear this closely. It's not for lack of vision, but for lack of resolve. And resolve is always born out of counting the cost. What is resolve? Well, resolve is simply determination. It's grit. And we could say it's fortitude. See, the truth is, it's easy. It's always easy to start a project. But finishing it is something different altogether. And this is where resolve and determination come in. Fortitude. This is God-empowered determination. God-empowered tenacity. God-empowered steadfastness. And it comes out of surrendering yourself to him and looking at the project in every angle. Believe it or not, considering the challenges that could present themselves will <laughs> reduces the shocks, surprises, and stress that often arise out of a path uh, to completion. If you've ever built a house or even bought a house, if you're building a house, you've got to deal with the builders, you've got to deal with the subcontractors, it could be a stressful event because you see one thing, they see another, and there's got to be middle ground. So, but what's interesting in all this is that the Holy Spirit will use questions, doubts, and fears that you may have to incite you then to count the cost before pursuing the dream that God has put in your heart. Isn't that interesting? And so for this reason, then, questions and doubts are valid. Not only valid, but should be dealt with before you make any big change in your life. Now, let me say this. Because if we're not careful, we will use the process of evaluation to promote doubt and fear. And that's not what it's about. Instead, it's an important step to help you develop an inner determination that will endure regardless, regardless of any obstacles or difficulties that you may encounter. The fact is, your new course of action will be challenged. It will be challenged. And whether you're starting a new career, opening a new business, maybe launching a new ministry, or even taking your family into a new direction, you will likely encounter difficulties you've never experienced before. It's a new way. So instead of being blindsided by what could happen, count the cost, think things through from the beginning. Pastor Kim and I write things down now. We talk back and forth the challenges that we may face. Now, we're not going to be able to, to alleviate every challenge. We're not even going to know every challenge. But what we do know is that the greater one is living on the inside of us. It's his plan, his purpose, and his will. 
My job is to take the impossibility of the dream and bring it to a possibility through faith. You know, Pastor Kim and I wholeheartedly stepped out in faith to start His Grace Church. We prayerfully examined the new endeavor to which God was calling us to. Man, when it was just a dream and a vision, it was big. It burned bright. It was, ooh, we could do this. In fact, we'll do it in record time. But we sought godly counsel from trusted friends, from ministry partners, from our pastors, and in the end concluded that launching the church was indeed God's plan. We didn't just wake up one morning and say, you know, I got nothing better to do. I don't like the church I'm going to, so I'm going to go to start a church. I want to be a pastor. I will tell you wholeheartedly and with a surety, pastoring was not my first job preference. In fact, it was pretty low on the ministry list. But that's what God called us to. Just because God equips you doesn't mean that you don't have to develop the equipment. Did you hear that? Well, there's a lot of people that have equipment that never develop it. So they use their, uh, I don't know how to say it. They, they use their gift. The Bible says, well, your gift will make room for yourself. Yes, it will make room. But if you don't develop it, it, it has no staying power. Man, that's some good nuggets this morning. Y'all missing good opportunities. However, then, when we stepped out with the full knowledge of what, what was before us, you see, we couldn't ascertain the whole scenarios. Couldn't ascertain. I never pastored. I mean, I've been working in churches, but. And the unique thing about the very, very beginning part of the vision and the dream, it would be, I would be like, God? He said, let's do this thing. Let's do this thing. And here's where I missed it. I thought it was going to be the easy peasy because God said, do it. God said, do it. It's going to be easy. God said, do it. And after nine years of trying to do it, we closed the church side and turn it into a ministry. <laughs> it was so easy that when I had the opportunity to run, I ran. Part of that was because, you know, John Michael had come into the world and he had special needs, but it wasn't the real truth. It just was hard. My faith had been tested and tried. I had been beaten. I had been down. I mean, every month we're trying to make budget. It just got old. And so when an opportunity came, I took it. Don't look at me that tone of voice like you wouldn't do the same. You've had opportunities that come says, quit, I'm done. <laughs> God says, no, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So for nine years, I worked. Another nine years after that, I worked in a supportive role as an executive pastor. And you know, the great thing about that is I got really, really comfortable Especially in the last several years, because I, I didn't have to make any decisions. I didn't have to worry about the budget. I didn't have to worry about any pressure. All I had to do was pay the bills and manage the staff. It was pretty cool. All that pressure I had before was on somebody else. And, you know, as I'm enjoying the peacefulness of being under somebody else. The Lord said, I need to stretch you a little bit. And the next major stretching that I've experienced was when the Lord told me in 2014 that His Grace Church must rise from the ashes. I didn't want to hear that. And I guarantee you, I went home and I made that exclamation to Pastor Kim. And she didn't want to hear it. And she just told me, no way. Ain't happening. We're not doing that again. We're not pioneering again. We are not. I will not. Read my lips. I will not be a part of that. Let's all look at Pastor Kim and say, right. I had to tell her. 
I mean, the first go around was so much fun that we literally walked away from it and considered permanent retirement from the ministry. <laughs> Yeah, and now God is making a bold statement that neither one of us wants to hear. How many of you have God, you thought God was done with you, and he's, he's stirring something in your heart? And it's not where you want to go. It's not what you want to do. But let me say this as well. We have an enemy whose sole purpose is to stop the advancement of God's kingdom. And as long as you're in the plan of God, he will work very diligently, daily, to stop forward movement in your life. So, coming back to the church then, again, the question swirled in my mind. Okay, we had a church. We don't have a church. And, and I don't know how, all this was going to transpire because I'm working now for another man in, a, in another church. Yes, His Grace Church is now His Grace Church. It's really Fuel for Life Ministries. I made sure we, we moved everything away we could from the church and took it under a 501c3 ministry. See, that way I was safe. So, but what Pastor Kim and I did do is we did take this to the Lord in prayer and begin to seek wisdom. We sought wisdom from my pastor and other trusted leaders. And from that, from that 2014, it took another three years for this statement of His Grace Church that it must rise from the ashes to come to pass. Too often we get in too much of a hurry and we want to rush things. When we closed His Grace Church in 2008, the church side of the ministry, that we did it in, in September, that October, an individual came to Pastor Kim and I and they said, we have a word from the Lord. I said, great. You're going to pastor again. I said, oh, really great. <sighs> And this is how it's going to play out. And they defined exactly how. Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but it's not something I want to hear. So I'm listening it to be nice. You ever just listen to somebody to be nice? You see their lips moving, but you're hoping it's not. But it was going in my ears, and it was taking root in my heart. And they said, you're going to make a decision that's going to cost you two and a half years of your ministry. Then you're going to go to work for an older pastor and he's going to retire, at, and I'm paraphrasing, and you will again take the church over. So, well, the first two and a half years played out. Now that got my attention. See, now that word that's in my heart, I've taken it off the shelf and then I came to work for an older minister. Now that's got my attention really well. And then, you know, he talked to me throughout the years. Oh, I'm going to retire. I'm going to retire. And then he said, I'm not ready to retire. And then he said, I'm going to retire. And I finally, you know, just like, you're going to retire or not? And the, well, in that year, he kept telling me, I'm going to retire. I said, if that's what you want to do, I'll support you. I don't want you to do it, but we've got to do it, you know, make prep preparations for it. The preparation came in December of that year when he said, up here from the pulpit, I'm retiring in four weeks. <laughs> he had talked to me that morning. And he said, I'm going to step down because we had a meeting and the Lord had, had dealt with him the week before. He said, I'm going to step down and do you want to continue with the work? I said, well, it's not my decision. We have to take before the people, but if they say yes, we will. He said, well, I'm going to be taking all the legal aspects of the church, the board, and everything, and you have to set up your own corporation. Well, see, we were already prepared. It was a seamless transition. December 1st, December 7th, he tells us he's retiring. December 31st, he's gone. Well, God already saw all that. It was already in the works. Everything was already in the process. 
See, it's very important that when God is calling you to an area, he's not going to violate his integrity or character as well. In church settings, I've seen too often people that God has called to start a new church, to start their own ministry, grab as many resources from where they are currently employed to assist them in their startup and where they're going. We didn't do that. I've had people come in and split our church. We didn't do that. What they're doing is they were fishing in another man's pond. And whatever God's calling you to do, he will provide resources for you to do it. We didn't know how this was all going to work. I knew, I knew in September of that year, I went to Pastor Kim. In September of 2017, I went to Pastor Kim and I told her, we're starting a church. I know it. It's so real. It's so, it's like, it's, you know, it started out way down the pike. Now it's right here. And I said, I don't know how this is going to work. And Pastor Kim said, I don't want to pioneer another work. I didn't either, because that's a lot of work. But God had a plan. God had a plan for the people of, at that time, was Life Family Church. He had a plan. He just wasn't going to kick you guys to the curb for those that are remaining, but he had a plan. And that plan had been in operation for almost 10 years That plan was that I would step in and fulfill and fill that place where God called me to, which was to serve you that were here at that time. So Pastor Odell retiring did not come as a shock to God. Oh, what are we going to do? He already had it planned out. So whatever God is calling you to do, I'm almost done. What God is calling you to do, he'll supply the resources. When we first started His Grace Church, there there were just so many needs. Oh, my goodness. There was more needs than provision. And one day I was driving along 410, and I was reminding God, I was now working for him. I was now in his business. I was now fulfilling the plan that he had called me to, and I was reminding him how many unmet needs at the church that we had and how I was expecting him to meet those needs. And I'll remember what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said, I'm not moved by your needs. I'm moved by your faith. And on the inside of me, I just sank because I knew I was in trouble. But God, take us from where we're at. Take us from what is impossible to the place where it becomes possible. So, again, questions abounded. And many naysayers were saying, how are you guys going to make this work? I don't know. What's your vision? What's your business model? You know, all those questions were good, legitimate concerns that needed to be considered. On the top of that, Originally, we had people all the time telling us that we should close the church based on our numbers, based on our finances. We had board members resign after several years because it looked like we were failures. This is HGC1. After three years in a hotel with no growth and a very, very, very small membership, we decided we needed a more permanent location. See, small beginnings doesn't mean failure. Very limited resources. We found a very small office space for lease. (laughs) Not in the most pleasant part of town, but in the inner city where we could afford it. And when I signed that lease, it was double what our monthly support was bringing in. And it was not the nicest building on the block. But we made it a nice place. In fact, the building was old, it was dingy, and it would only hold 50 chairs. And for the first several months, Pastor Kim and I had to pay out of our own pocket to make up the rent. Sometimes the vision is going to cost you in the beginning. And within that time, I was stretched beyond measure, but I learned how to trust God, and we began to grow until we, were, we grew out of that little building. I knew... That no matter what people were telling me, 
we should close, we should give up, we should quit. I was doing the right thing at the right time. And no matter what anyone said to us, we continued week in and week out, year after year after year. God confirmed his calling. So once your questions and concerns have been addressed and God's calling has been confirmed, then your next step is to set your heart on the assignment and hold on to it with all your might. That's exactly what we did. And this is what God tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promises. What would have happened? Pastor Kim and I just said, you know, this is too hard. This isn't worth it. And I've said that in my heart, just like you have. Not concerning the church, I hope, but other things in your life. When we look at the word hold tightly in this verse, it's very important. They are a translation of the Greek, of the Greek word keta echo, which is a compound of the word keta and echo. And the preposition that kata carries is the idea of something that comes downward or something that comes down so hard and heavily it is overpowering, dominating, and even subjugating. As a result, then, it is something that conquers, subdues, and immediately begins to demonstrate its overwhelming influence and influencing power. The word echo here means I have, and it carries the idea of possession. So when, we, when, when the compounded, when compounded, the new word kata echo doesn't just mean to embrace, it actually means to embrace something tightly. And because of the inclusion, the preposition, kata, it is the image of someone who finds the object of his dreams and then holds it down, even to the point of sitting on it. Sitting on it in order to dominate and take control of it. What's interesting about this word keta echo is that it can also be used negatively, which is what we see in Romans 1.18. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The word suppress in this verse is keta echo. It's the same word we see hold fast in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. But in this case, it describes wicked men who are holding back and suppressing the truth, lest it get out and positively challenges or change the way people think and believe. When dream killers come, they come to try to talk you out of your God-given dream. When that happens, you've got to wrap your arms around it, sit on top of it, and don't let anyone pull you away from it. And that's what it means to hold fast the profession of your faith. And in our next lesson, we'll examine the four primary, I call them um, four crazy friends, four primary dream killers that will come to take your dream or word from God. They're going to include time, Satan, your friends, and your family, and they make your four crazy friends. Pursuing your dream will always require God's stretching. Amen. I know this morning was a little bit longer than normal, but the intro was necessary to put out the information. But God has a plan for your life. If you go out with nothing else this morning, know that before I was formed in my mother's womb, he knew me and he had a plan for me. Before the foundations of the world, he knew me and had a plan for me and specifics. He has a spe specific plan for you. It's not just generalities where you just float through space and time continuum and you just, ooh, God's got a plan. He's got specific things for you to do. And if you're a part of His Grace Church, there's a specific reason why you are here. It's not just hap stance, you just show up. God has a plan and a purpose for your being here. My plan and purpose for you being here, <laughs> no. But, you know, you have to know who you are and what you are. God has called His Grace Church to develop, to train, to recruit, and to mobilize for an end-time army. This is a training center. 
We're here to train. Education is important. The word of God is truth. There's too many people that are going in life today that don't have an idea of the power of the word of God. That's why we're going to help develop end time harvest gatherers for the work of the ministry. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. This morning you may be in this house or you may be watching through any one of our multimedia devices, social media, and maybe you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to give you that opportunity right now. The Bible says in John chapter 14 and verse 16, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. Jesus tells us in, in Romans uh, chapter 10, I think verse 12, that anyone or everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 tell us exactly how to become saved. That is, we'll confess with our mouth what we believe in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead. We will be born again. If you've never, ever accepted the most precious and wonderful thing that God has given his son, Jesus Christ, I invite you to do so right now by praying this prayer alongside Pastor Kim and myself. And together, we will, we will lead you into the kingdom of heaven. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, I ask you, forgive me of all my sins. Forgive me of all my Jesus, sins. Jesus, Jesus, I ask you, I ask you, to come into my heart, to come into my heart, become Lord of my life, to become Lord of I my life. I confess with my mouth, I confess with my mouth, and believe in my heart, and believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead, that you were raised from the from dead. From this moment forward, from this moment forward, I'm born again. I'm born again. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm on my and way I'm to a heaven. New creation in Christ. And I'm a new creation if in Christ. You prayed that prayer for the very first time. Pastor Kim and I are so excited for you. Something wonderful yes, and miraculous amen. is going on in your heart right now. You may not understand it, but it's okay. Hallelujah. Amen. And check out the new birth <laughs> series on our uh, website. Um, it's under our resource page at www.hgc.church. Amen. You know what? And if you want to get caught up on our other series and, and things that are other teachings are out there, you know, check us out on social media, you know, subscribe to us on YouTube, like us on Facebook. You know, we got you covered 24 seven. And let's plug rumble because we're on rumble, you know, the okay. rumble. Gotcha. Well, you know what? We'll see you next Thursday, all right? And um, don't forget. It's for, for Amplify, not Amplified. All right. What is it? Amplify. Amplify, yeah. Notice so you we'll, put the past we'll tense see back you next it. time on uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. at 6995 Alamo Downs Parkway, right? That's right. All right. Pastor Kim and Pastor Sandy are going to come and pronounce a quick blessing, and then we're dismissed. And before they do, I want to remind you that. Pastor Kim and I believe that God has something unique to say to you this week. And our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. God bless you, Pastor Mark and Pastor Sandy.